Well, good to be in church tonight. Good to see you in the house of God. Appreciate everybody being here and being in service tonight. And uh, she blessed my heart. I was afraid I wouldn't get to speak to her after service, so I want to speak to her. Amen. But it is good to be here tonight. Good to be in the service. Some years ago, I was coming down the road one day, and the best I remember is a dirt road at this time, and I was pulling a little trailer behind my car, and I met a highway patrol, and I took all of my side of the road and a good part of his too, and he didn't think much of that, and he turned around and come back and stopped me and reminded me that I need to drive on the right side of the road, and I said, yes, sir, I'll do that. Thank you for the reminder. He got in his car, started down the road, followed me down the road. And lo and behold, the probably red light at that time come on again. Some of y'all don't remember red lights. Come on again. And I looked up in my mirror and I saw that light flash and I said, oh no, not again. And when I come in tonight, some of you said, looked at me and said, oh no, not again. So I'm here, amen, and amen. Good to see you in the service tonight. Good to be in the house of God tonight. That's a long getting around just saying that one, but anyhow, good to see you in the service tonight. Appreciate you being here, and good to be back at Berean Baptist Church tonight. It's always an honor and always a joy for me to come and be here at this church. Uh, the only thing I hate not seeing the pastor. Boy, I love you, preacher, and uh, he's my friend. He's my dear friend, and I love him tonight, and I want to encourage you to pray for him, and his surgery will be before long at all. So do remember that and remember him in prayer and pray for him that God will touch him. I hope God lets him pastor here to he's 120. Can anybody else say amen? amen? And I really mean that. I really do. If he stays here to he's 120, uh, that probably get me out of here too. But anyhow, and uh, I love him tonight. I sure do. And I appreciate your pastor. What a man of God. And uh, thank God for him. Not only a good man of God takes the right stand, stands right, but uh, he's a preacher. Amen. I love hearing him preach. I, I'll tune in on the TV thing every once in a while. It's not TV. What do you call it? Internet, whatever. And uh, I don't even do that. She does it. And then I watch it. Amen. But anyhow, I enjoy hearing him preach. I'm good to be in the service tonight. Appreciate everybody being here on this prayer meeting tonight. And good to be in the service tonight. I want you to stand with me. And I'm going to have a word of prayer with you tonight. I'm going to let you sit down while I read the text tonight because I'm going to talk a little bit before I read tonight, okay? Let's stand for a word of prayer. And uh, I have a real desire to be a blessing tonight. And I want to be a blessing. I want to be a help to you tonight. And uh, God really spoke to my heart about this message uh, for the service tonight. And I pray God will use it, speak to our hearts tonight in an unusual way. Let's bow for prayer. Father, thank you for your blessings today. Thank you for the opportunity to come to the house of God tonight. Uh, Lord, it is a joy to be here tonight. I feel like David tonight uh, when he said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go unto the house of God. And what a joy it is to be here this evening. Uh, Lord, the good singing that we've already heard tonight. Uh, Lord, thank you for your blessings tonight. Thank you for what you're doing. And I pray you'll speak to our hearts out of the word of God tonight. Then, Lord, I do pray you help the preacher tonight. Lord, I pray be with Pastor Betty. Use him tonight. What a blessing he is, God. And I pray that you'll help him. I touch him. God, give him that that he needs tonight as he preaches. And Lord, I know he's got a busy week. I know he's got a busy schedule. And I pray you'll strengthen his body and give him that that he needs tonight. Lord, not only tonight, but even next week. I have surgery coming up. I do pray again that you'll bless him that and meet every need. Then most of all tonight, Lord, I pray if there is somebody here lost tonight, I pray they'll be saved tonight. And I do pray this evening, in God that you'll encourage hearts in this service tonight. And I'll thank you for all you do in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for standing to be seated. Genesis chapter number 18. Genesis chapter 18. And I want to say while you're turning, that's probably my one of my favorite books. I got a lot of them in the Old Testament. But Genesis chapter 18 is, and the book of Genesis tonight is a wonderful, wonderful book tonight. When you study the book of Genesis tonight, the word Genesis itself simply means beginning tonight. 
Now, that doesn't mean that God had a beginning because he did not have a beginning. Uh, it was the beginning of a lot of things in Genesis chapter 1. And you don't read very far down through the book of Genesis to begin to read about a man by the name of Abram, or we know him tonight as Abraham. And you begin to study about Abraham, you'll find in the latter part of chapter number 11 and chapter number 12, you'll find it probably was the conversion of Abraham. And when you come to chapter number 12, of course, you have what we call today uh, the Abraham covenant. And thank God for that today. Also in chapter number 12, we have Abraham's compromise. And when I say compromise, what I simply mean by that is uh, he went to Egypt. It was never the will of God to go to Egypt. And you'll find Abraham in chapter number 12 uh, taking his family there and winding up in Egypt. And the latter part of chapter number 12, you have Abraham's confession. He comes back out of Egypt in chapter number 12 and beginning part of chapter 13. And you have Abraham's confession, getting right with God uh, because you're going to Egypt there. And then also when you come to chapter number 13 tonight, you have Abraham's, you have Abraham's compassion. If you remember chapter 13, uh, there's a strife between the uh, uh, Abraham's cattle men and those that took care of Abraham's cattle and those that took care of Lot's cattle. And there was a strife. There was an argument between them. And you remember what Abraham said? Abraham told Lot, he said, you take one way and I'll take the other way. And the Bible said in Genesis 13 that Lot pitched his tent towards Sodom. And that doesn't mean he went the first day. That doesn't mean he went the second day. But day by day by day he goes towards Sodom. And uh, you always go backwards when you backslide. Did you hear what I said? And Lot winds up down in Sodom and Gomorrah. And when you study about those, there were five of those cities there. And when you study about them tonight, you'll find that homosexuality was on every side. And uh, God got fed up with that and God said, here's what I'll do. I'll destroy the whole outfit. I'll destroy the cities there of Sodom and Gomorrah. And if you remember studying your Bible, you'll find that Abraham began to pray for Lot. And, uh, and begin to pray that God would spare him. And of course, God did spare him. And when you come to chapter number 18 here, uh, you'll find that God sent three angels down uh, to deliver Lot out. If you look in chapter number uh, 18, look at verse number two. And he lifted up his eyes, talking about Abraham, and he lifted up his eyes and looked, and three men stood by him. Now, uh, there's something unusual about that. Look at chapter 19. In chapter 19, look at verse one. Bible said in verse number one, and there came two angels to Sodom at evening. My question tonight is this tonight. Who was the third angel and where did he go? Uh, two of them come down to deliver Lot out. And they did deliver Lot out. Uh, but who was his third one tonight? Uh, what is he doing and who is his third one here uh, that the Bible talks about here? Well, if you said in chapter number 18 tonight, you'll find it's the Lord himself. And he stops off at Abraham's house and he's got an announcement for Abraham. You'll say, preacher, what is the announcement? Here it is. Get the nursery ready. You get, <laughs> get the nursery ready. You'll say, what do you mean by that? Well, that's kind of unusual because Abraham's 100 years old. And, Lot, and, and, and Sarah's 90 years old. And God says to him here, uh, the question is, or the, uh, uh, the statement was, I'll get the nursery ready. Look at chapter number 18. Bible says in verse number 10, and he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life. And lo, Sarah, thy wife shall have a son. Now I'll remind you again, he's 100 years old. And God is saying to him, you're getting ready to have a baby. That's, uh, that's a pretty good statement. Look at the rest of the verse. Uh, and Sarah heard it in the tent door, uh, which was behind him. And Bob said in verse number 11, and Abraham and Sarah was old, and well stricken in age, and it ceased to be with Sarah uh, after the manner of women. There's no way. You're not going to see an out of your woman expected. Can I get a witness? I, I've never seen one. Uh, notice the next verse. Therefore Sarah laughed in verse number 12. How uh, therefore Sarah laughed within herself saying, After I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure? My Lord be no law so. Can I comment on that? Did you ladies see what she called her husband? Y'all didn't see it, did you? <laughs> well, we're moving on. Look at verse 12 again. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself saying, After I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure? My what? My Lord. How, you say, well, I'm not calling my husband Lord. Well, uh, Peter must have liked it because he repeated New Testament. I got to get off this because I'm going to kill the service. Hold on. <laughs> so, oh, uh, 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 
have pleasure, my Lord, being all off. So look at verse 13. And the Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sir Elias say it? As shall have surety by our child, which am all. Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I will return unto thee, according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Uh, then Paul said, Then Sarah did not say it. I laughed not. For she was afraid. He said, Nay, but thou didst laugh. I'm interested tonight in verse 14. And I'm interested in this story here about Abraham tonight. But notice in verse number 14 again tonight. Bible said in verse 14, Is there anything too hard for God? And I'll say this tonight. Thank God there's nothing too hard for the Lord. When you come to Genesis chapter 18 tonight, you'll find there's three tremendous questions. I'm not going to preach on them. I'm just going to preach on one of them. But there's three tremendous questions that's asked here in this chapter tonight. For instance, in verse 14, look at the verse again. Is there anything too hard for the Lord? That is an awesome question tonight. But look at verse number 23. Latter part of verse 23. Wilt thou also destroy uh, the righteous with the wicked? That is a tremendous question also. Look at uh, verse number, latter part of verse 25. Uh, Shall not the judge have all the earth do right? That's three tremendous questions. But I'll just deal with one of them tonight. Bible said in verse 14 again, is there anything too hard for God? And I want to preach tonight on that thought tonight. Thank God there's nothing too hard for the Lord this evening. I I thought about the day that we're living in. And uh, I've never in my life experienced a day like we're living in right now. And I'm sure you'd say the same thing. And I'll tell you this dark day that you and I are living in. Thank God there's nothing too hard for God tonight. Have you ever stopped to realize this evening who he is? I'm not going to take time, but if you go back to chapter 17, have verse number one and two, God shows Abraham uh, who he is tonight. And I'll tell you something tonight. Thank God he's a big God tonight. He's an awesome God tonight, and there's nothing that he can't do this evening. I thought about, and don't turn because it's not going to take time, but Isaiah 55. And Isaiah 55, if you study it, uh, God said that his ways are higher than our ways. He said his thoughts are higher than the heavens from our thoughts tonight. Think about what I just said. His thoughts is higher than the heavens, higher than our thoughts tonight. I thought about this when I stood in today. Take all of our education, take all of our learning, take all our computer technology and all the knowledge we have in the world tonight and put it in a wheelbar and then take God's smallest thought and put in with our big thoughts, and God's smallest thought would blow all of our big thoughts to kingdom come. Anybody get what I just said? (laughs) I'm telling you tonight, he's a big God tonight. And I'm glad I can report to you tonight, I thank God there's nothing too hard for God. I'm glad I believe that this evening. I'm glad I believe what the Word of God says this evening. And I'll say this to you tonight, I thank God there's nothing uh, too hard for God. There's not anything he can't do this evening. Uh, uh, you say, well, Brother Barker, you don't understand uh, what, I'm go- what I'm going through and you may not understand what I'm facing right now. I'll say to you again tonight, there's nothing too hard for God this evening. When I see God do certain things, I just step back in amazement how that God works and how that God moves tonight. And I want to encourage you as a church tonight, listen to me, put faith in God. He answers prayer. Put faith in God. He's able to meet that need tonight. Whatever it is tonight, thank God. He's able to meet that need tonight. I want to pick out three things about Abraham's life tonight and show you tonight there's nothing too hard for God. Notice me first of all, I want to say, first of all tonight, the Bible says in the text here tonight, verse 14 again, is anything too hard for the Lord? And I'll say, first of all tonight, if you want to write them down, write them down. Number one, I'll say, first of all tonight, there's never been a prayer prayed that God can't answer. Now, I don't know if that does anything for you or not, but it makes me want to run the interstate 40 back. Because there's never been a prayer prayed that God can't answer tonight. I I don't know about you, but I'll be honest with you. When I get down on my knees and pray and ask God for something other, and then to get up off my knees and see God do that, I get excited about that. 
I know that God heard my prayer and know that God is well aware of what I need this evening. So I'll say first of all that how there's nothing that a prayer prayed that God can't answer. Now I know what you're saying and how do you tie that in with Abraham? Well listen to this. Do you realize tonight Abraham was a praying man. Everywhere Abraham went he would build an altar. For instance in chapter 12 and verse number 8 you find Abraham built an altar. Chapter 13, verse number 4, you find Abraham praying again. Chapter 13, verse number 8, you find Abraham praying again. Chapter 13, verse number 18, how you find Abraham built another altar. Chapter 15, verse number 2, you find him praying again. Chapter 17, verse number 3, how you find him praying again. And in chapter 18, over and over again, Lord, would you spare Sodom? Would you spare the city? If I find 50 righteous, if I find 40, if I find 30, you know the story. And, uh, and I'll say this to you tonight, there's never been a prayer prayed that God can't answer. Now, I don't know what you're praying about tonight. I don't know what you, what, what's on your mind tonight, on your heart. But I'm dead to tell you tonight, thank God, there's never been a prayer prayed that God can't answer. Now, I don't know about you, but that sure does encourage my heart. To know that God will hear a country boy's prayer. To know that God will hear our prayer tonight. And again, I'll say to you about Abraham tonight. He's a praying man. And I'll say to you as a church tonight, I don't know what you're praying about, but I'll tell you, keep on praying, thank God. He said, God, thank God that ain't your prayer tonight. I remember years ago, I was pastoring Pastor Beatty's home church. I pastored 16 years. And uh, I've been there a few years and we ran our room. And beside the church, we bought land. I know three times while I was there, maybe four times. And beside the church, there's a road that went right down beside the church. And the road actually was this, it was a driveway actually, probably was as close to the church as that step right there. And on the side, other side of that, there was seven acres of land and a house and man, we needed it. We desperately needed it. I mean, you couldn't even park on that side of the church without the back of the car being out in the edge of that road. And uh, <clears throat> we began to pray about that land. And the two guys, these two brothers that owned it, one of them lived here in Winston and the other lived close to the church tower. And I don't know what happened, but somewhere about 40 or 50 years before I got there, somebody made them guys mad at the church. And they despised the church they despise God. They despise anything that was right, righteous, and holy. And uh, they, uh, I, I, I mean, for them to sell that to the church, you can forget it. That's not going to happen. And I told the Lord, I said, Lord, if you let us have that property, we'll remodel the house, make a nice missions quarters out of it, and I'll take the other six acres and build a nice retirement home for the old people. And uh, that was in my heart. I prayed about that, and I prayed about that, and that was in my heart. And uh, one day, one of the brothers up and died. And when that brother died, the property come up for sale. And they put a for sale sign up right beside our church for that property. And the one that was living, the brother that was living, uh, contacted me through somebody else and said this, don't you even ask for that land. You're not going to get that land. Don't, the church will never have that land, so there's no need to call and ask about it. Well, that was encouraging. And uh, we prayed and we prayed, and I got my deacons together, and I said, fellas, I said, uh, boy, it'd be nice if God let us have that property. We had land on the other side, but we needed that. And uh, I said, man, we could remodel that house and make a nice mission quarters out lot where missionaries could stay. And, we could take out the six acres and someday down the road, maybe build a retirement home for our old people. And uh, time went on for a while, and as far as I know, not one person ever looked at that house. Uh, several months it sat there, not, not one, to, to my knowledge, ever looked at that house. One day I'm sitting in my office one Friday afternoon. Phone rang, and I picked it up, and I said, This is Pastor Barker, can I help you? And the guy said, Yes, sir. He said, I'm so and so. And I'm a lawyer in Winston-Salem. He said, I may know a way that y'all can buy that property. I just want to let you know that, and I'll be calling you back. So during them days, we'd have, quite often, we'd have an all-night prayer meeting. 
on Friday night. One morning at two o'clock in the morning, I walked around the corner of the church outside and I looked at that house and I looked at seven acres of property and the Holy Ghost spoke to my heart and said, don't pray anymore. Everything's going to be all right. Don't pray anymore. Sunday morning, I called the deacons meeting together. I got the guys together and I said, look, God has assured me that we're going to wind, I don't know how, but God has assured me we're going to wind up with that property. One of my deacons looked at me, and I'm sure he probably was kidding, but here's what he said. He said, on your faith, I said, hang on, buddy, just wait and see. A few weeks went by on a Friday afternoon as I'm sitting in my office, and phone rings again. And it's that lawyer here in Winston-Salem. He said, sir, I understand y'all may be interested in that property. And I said, well, I don't know, it all depends. He said, uh, would y'all be willing to buy it? I said, we may would. I wasn't going to let him know how I felt about it. And he said, uh, I said, uh, what are you asking for it? I think it was 100,000, something over 100, and it would have easily brought that. And the night that God put on my heart was going to buy it, he put the figure on my heart also. And uh, he said, when he told me the figure, he said, uh, no, we're probably not interested. And uh, he said, well, what would make you interested? I said, $57,000. And when I said that, he laughed at me. He, he really made fun of me. He laughed at me. He has to say, you've lost your mind. You don't know what you're talking about. And uh, I almost cursed and hung the phone up. He had no more and got the phone hung up and the devil sat right down in my office beside of me. And here's what he said, you're a fool. At that time, we probably had three, four hundred thousand dollars in treasure. And he said, you are a fool. You've lost it. You're a fool. I said, just wait, big boy. We'll see who the fool is. Several weeks went by and didn't hear a thing. One afternoon, I'm sitting in my office and the phone rings again. And it's that lawyer. He said, that Robert, you still interested in that property? I said, well, it might be. He said, yeah, and I know what, might, what the might be be. <laughs> and I said, uh, I told you what we would do. And he said, you know, you'll never get it. You know, you, you know you're the church not supposed to have it. And uh, you know y'all's not going to get it if something don't special happen. And I said, well, I prayed about it. That's what God told me. And that's what I'm telling you. And that's exactly what we'll do. He, he almost cussed me out. And it went on and on for a long time on the conversation. Now for a bit, here's what he said. Have your secretary and clerk of the church meet us Monday afternoon in the office. We'll sign the paperwork and you can have the house. $57,000. And we wound up with it. Remodeled the house. Missionaries stay in it. Even tonight as I'm speaking, there's probably some in it right now. The retirement home is sitting there. It got built. And every bit of that's sitting there tonight. All that was paid for. And, uh, but that's not the good part of the story. He said, what's the good part of the story? The other brother that was alive that hated God, church, and everybody else. One July afternoon, I was getting ready for our youth camp. Had my bib overhauls on outside working and the phone rang. My wife said, uh, somebody wants you on the phone. I came into Parsonage. And it was the old man that owned the other part of the property. It was his daughter-in-law. And she said, preacher, daddy wants to see you. He's about 85 years old this time. Daddy wants to see you. And I'd visit him many, many, many times. I knocked on his door. He didn't like me, but I liked him. I don't know why he didn't like me. I never done nothing to do it. But he didn't like anything. Anybody do anything with church. And he said, Daddy wants to see you. I said, okay. Tell him I'll be up there and just fit it. And uh, I hung a phone up, reached up on the shelf, got my little testament, took it down my pocket. And I told my wife, I said, Mr. So-and-so's getting ready to get saved. She just kind of looked at me. And I went out the door and I went up there and I knocked on his door summer afternoon. Hot, screen door, no air condition. And this old man's about 85 years old. He's almost blind, couldn't see. Health declining. And I knocked on that door and he said, Preacher, is that you? I said, yes, it is. He said, come in here. And when I walked in there, they'd already got me a straight back chair and set it down right beside his chair. And he looked up with me with tears ran down his face. He said, Preacher, I think it's about time he's getting right with God and getting saved. And I led him to Christ, sitting right there in that house, and told that story at his funeral when I did his funeral. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying tonight? There's never been a prayer prayed that God can't answer. I don't know what you're praying about tonight. I don't know what you're expecting tonight, but I'm glad, thank God. Hear me tonight. Abraham was a praying man, and there's nothing, there's nothing that there's nothing too hard for God. Man, you know what? I can tell stories like that all day long. Over the last 52 years, I've seen God do that.
I, I want to tell you tonight, listen to me, child of God. There's nothing too hard for God. You say, preacher, you know what I'm praying about? I don't have to know what you're praying about. God knows what it is. Hey, listen, there's never been a prayer prayer. And God can't answer, amen. But then I want to say number two out of this text tonight. And can I say this before I move? Don't give in. Amen. Don't give up. Don't give out. Just keep on praying. Just keep on praying. My son is my pastor. I'm a member of his church. Been a member of it ever since I left the pastor. And I work out of that church. That's my home church. If I lived here, I'd work out of this church. But anyhow, I live there. So my son is my pastor. But if I had time, I'd tell you a story tonight you'd never believe. Uh, there was a day in my life I never thought he would have been a preacher. Uh, but I will tell you, there's nothing too hard for God. He's never been, he's never been a prayer prayer. And God can't answer my soul. Number two, notice in our text tonight. Not only there's never been a prayer prayer that God can't answer. Watch verse number 11 with me tonight. Bible said again in verse number 11. And Abraham and Sarah was old and well stricken in age. And it ceased to be with Sarah after the matter of women. Therefore Sarah laughed and herself saying, After I'm waxed old, shall I have pleasure? My Lord being old also. Listen to this. There's never been a prayer prayed that God can't answer. But I'll say number two tonight. There's never been a problem so big that God can't solve. I'm about to get happy. I said, <laughs> I said there's never been a problem so big. That God can't solve this evening. I don't care what the situation is. I don't care how big. Let, let me ask you this question tonight. Would you agree with me they got a problem? By the way, I have five grandchildren. I have five great grandchildren. And the fifth one was born yesterday. Praise God. And uh, it's wonderful. You want me to tell you what's better than being a Having grandchildren, great grandchildren. And I can't wait till we get the great, great. Are y'all listening? <laughs> I hear me tonight. I, I won't tell you tonight. Would you agree with me they got a problem? I remember when Jeremiah, my oldest grandson, was born. And you're talking about a preacher. I wish you could hear my grandson preach. Man, he play the hand of a guitar, write songs, preach a house down. He's in Kentucky this week in a meeting right now. And uh, man, God's used him all over the country. But I remember when Jeremiah was born. And I remember that night that my daughter went into labor. I told my wife, I said, man, we're going to be there when it happens. We're going to be there when it happens. And uh, it was on a Saturday afternoon. I was pastoring Turner's Creek. And boy, we took off to Concord Hospital. That's where they live. And uh, her husband was assistant pastor to church there. And uh, so we took off to the hospital. And I know we'll forget that night I sat there at the hospital. He, uh, he was supposed to have been born that day. That day was a national holiday, and that was the day he was supposed to be born. That national holiday is June 1. That's my birthday. So he was supposed to, he was supposed to have been born that day. But you know what? He was stubborn, and he didn't come to June the 2nd. But here's what I started to say to you. I sat there at the hospital that night all night long waiting on Jeremiah to be born. And I don't know what happened that day. Somebody said it was a full moon. I don't know what it was. But there must have been 25 women come in. Some of them looked like it was 14 months. I'm telling you. And you know, I didn't see one of them I thought was 70 years old. I didn't see one I thought was 65. I didn't see one I thought was 60. I didn't see one I thought was 55. I didn't see one I thought was... I'm stopping. I don't know what stop. I, I didn't see any of that. And here she is tonight. She's 90 years old. Would you agree with me they got a problem? She's not going to have a baby if God don't do something. Amen. And him being 100 years old, according to Hebrews, uh, his seed's already dead. But I'll say tonight, there's never been a problem so big that God can't solve tonight. Mm. You'll agree they got a problem. And by the way, somebody asked me the other day, said, uh, can you tell us real quick what's your definition of pastor? I said, real quick, one word. They said, what? I said, problems. <laughs> Are you listening? But they're good problems. They're not bad problems. And there, there's all kinds of problems tonight. There's spiritual problems. There's social problems. There's financial problems. Hey, there's domestic problems. But you know what? God specializes in hard cases. It doesn't matter how hard it is. God specializes in taking care of it tonight. Hear me tonight. There's never been a problem so big that God can't solve. My wife and I are praying about some stuff right now. 
And it's going to take the God of heaven to get it done. But I'm going to stand back and shout when he does it. Because I know he can do it tonight. Hey, I don't come too far down the road. I to doubt him. I know, thank God. I know he'd do it tonight. I thought about Israel. When Israel left Egypt and started the promised land. After that passed overnight, they leave out. They get down to the Red Sea. The Red Sea's in front of them. Mountains on both sides of them. And the Egyptian army coming behind them pursuing uh, at hot pursuit. And boy, I want to tell you, uh, I, I, I think about Moses quite often. Oh my, I can't imagine what he went through. Pastor two million plus people and everyone on backslide at the same time. You know what they said? Let's go back. It had been better that we died in Egypt. Let's just go back. Are you listening? <laughs> they said, uh, we'll go back. Moses said, stand still. God said, go forward. And you know the story. Moses takes that rod, holds it up over the Dead Sea, and the Bible said that it opens up. And he rolled it back. The Word of God says there in uh, Exodus 15 with the right hand of his power. And they march through on dry ground and go out on the other side. I read what a liberal said this about that. Really what happened was at that time of the year, the Red Sea had dried up and they went marching through on ankle deep water. If that is true, that's a bigger miracle than what the Bible says. You say, why? How's God going to drown the Egyptian army in ankle deep water? Huh? Are y'all hearing me preach tonight? No, there's never been a problem so big for God. Hey, I'm telling you, I don't know what you I know Abraham and Sarah had a problem, but I also know this tonight. I know God's able to take care of that problem tonight. Hey, it's never been a problem so big that God can't solve. Now, now listen to this. You know what man likes to do? Man likes to fix problems. Women like to sit down and worry about them. But man likes to put their hands on it and fix it. That's the way I am tonight. Something get tore up, I want to fix it. My wife, she'll worry about it and talk about it and cry about it. But I, I, I say, bless the Lord, I'll fix it. But you know what God does sometimes? God sometimes takes away all of our ability to where we have no ability so his ability can be revealed. Amen. Huh? Yeah, again, let me say this. When problems come, I forever want to pull out my little lifeboat. I'll fix it. Yes, sir, I'll take care of it. I'll fix it. I'll do it. <laughs> but boy, when I do, what a mess. And God, the whole time, sitting over here in the corner looking at me and saying, how about it, big boy? Go ahead and fix it. Take care of it. But when you get done, if you'll get out of the way, I'll fix it. I'm preaching good. Are y'all hearing me? I'm telling you not. There's never been a problem so big that God can't solve tonight. And again, let me reemphasize this tonight. He, he waits till we have no ability uh, so we can see his ability. And I'll tell you tonight, listen, friend, there's never been a problem. You say, preacher, you don't understand. Uh, I got a problem in the home. I got a problem on the job. I got a problem. I don't know what the problem is, but I know this tonight, child of God. There's never been a problem so big that God can't solve. I'm standing at the front door many years ago when I was pastoring a church, and I'm not going to tell you which one. That particular day, this man and his wife come out the door. And his wife had on a pair of those large sunglasses that they give you when you have cataract surgery. You know what I'm talking about? I'm talking about they cover it all, come back to here. And she comes out the door that morning with that large pair of sunglasses on. And I say, hey, ma'am, I, I hope you're okay. She didn't comment. She didn't say anything hardly at all. She went on out. And the next Sunday or the next service, I saw her somewhere. And her whole side of her face right here was black. Her eye was almost swollen together. Her husband had been beating her. Now, you don't know what I think about that guy. I, I want to say, if you want to pick on somebody, let's go down behind the church. Hello? A man's sorry that he hit a woman. I don't care who you are. I don't care how big you are. You say, preacher, you don't know what you're saying. You're here by yourself. Oh, no, I'm not here by myself. I brought the trio with me. And I got something else too if I need it. Right, listen, I'm telling you, hear me tonight. I want to, to stomp that guy. A man that we hit a woman. And, the, and his wife called me and said, preacher, we need to talk. 
And I said, okay. She said, me and so-and-so, her husband, I'll not call his name. We're having problems. We need to talk. I said, that'll be fine. I'll meet you in my office a certain day, but I'm not going to talk to you by yourself. He's got to come with you. And boy, when he come that day, I'm telling you, it took God the Father and God the Son, God the Holy Ghost all keep me calm. I, I, I want to lay hands on him. And I, I mean that. I want to say, uh, hit me one time. I got, I got to get out of this. I'm going to get in the flesh. But listen, I, are you hearing me? And uh, he said to her, and he'd been beating on her. How sorry. I'm telling you, you're sorry on dirt if you'd hit a woman. If you're watching the internet tonight and you beat on your wife, won't you find somebody your side? Won't you find somebody else? I move it. I'm going to get in trouble. But listen to me. They sat down before me in that office that day. And I told him something I really didn't even believe myself. I said, I'll tell you something. God can work this out. Your marriage don't have to be this way. God can work this thing out. And in the back side of my mind, I'm, I'm, I'm mad, I'm aggravated, and I'm saying to myself, that, that ain't going to work. And they hadn't even got off the property, and I looked at my wife, and I said, that, that's over. That's not going to work. That's not. But I told them it would work. Anybody got any idea what happened? It did work. <laughs> hey, they got right with God. He got right with God. They come to church happy from then on. After got thoroughly right with God. I'm trying to tell you now, there's never been a problem. I don't care what the problem is that God can't take care of. Hallelujah, man. Aren't you glad we serve a God like that? Uh, you say, well, preacher, you, you just don't understand. Listen to me. If you're right with God and you live for God and you give right and you do right, I'm telling you this seed in God, I promise you, there's never been a problem so big that God can't solve. After those 40 years of pastoring, these eight years of evangelism and missions. I remember years ago when I was pastoring. And God let me pastor some good church. I had three great churches. And uh, I didn't leave with one of them because I had to. I left because God put in my heart to leave. But, but, but I remember down through the years, those almost 40 years of pastoring, man, problems would arise in the church. Situations would come. And, and a lot of them were situations that I couldn't address from the pulpit. And uh, the deacons and I, we'd talk about it and we'd want to lay our hands on them, but, but, but we couldn't do it. And, uh, and, and I'd go to a private place and I said, Dear God, you, this is your church. It's not my church. It's your church. You sit upon this rock, I'll build my church. That's your church. And, and I said, Lord, if you're going to let uh, Sister Wiggle Jaws and uh, a Big Mouth do what, it's your church. It's your church. Listen to me tonight. When you give it to him, Hello, I'm preaching good. Man, if you'll just get into it, he'll shock you. He'll amaze you what he'll do. I want to say tonight, there's never been a problem so big that God can't solve. Now, I like where y'all looking at me tonight. Some of y'all sit back there doing this. Because you know why? You've been where I'm talking about. The problems, all kinds of problems. And I'll just say this and move in real quick. I never remember a time in my life, I'm not near as old as, some of these people here, these fellows here from the front row, I'm not as old as they are, but <laughs> I can never remember a time in my life of seeing our nation in the mess it's in right now. I can never remember a time in my life of seeing our community in our county, the mess it's in right now. And I want to tell you, there's only one answer to that tonight. It's not in the White House. It's not Mr. Trump. It's not Mr. Democrat, Mr. Republican. Only one that can take care of that tonight is God. Are you hearing me? And I'm glad tonight, I'm glad I know a God that's able. I'm telling you, friend, there's nothing. Hey, there's nothing too hard for God. I want to say number three out of this text, and I'm done. Not only there's never been a prayer prayed that God can't answer. Then I want to say there's never been a problem so big. Is there anything too hard for the Lord that God can't solve? But let me say number three in closing tonight. There's never been a person so wicked that God can't save. You say, how'd you get that out of that text? Well, would you agree with me that Lot's a wicked man? I'll tell you this. If you go to the book of Matthew and go back 39 books, that's the whole Old Testament. If that's all you had tonight, I would say Lot is a lost man. But when you come to the New Testament, God had something to say about that. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 6 through 9 talked about being a just man, a righteous man, a man that backs his righteous soul. Again, if you just had the Old Testament and that's all, of course, you could say it this way. God did get him out before the judgment fell. And God's going to get you and I here before the judgment falls too. But here's what I started to say. When you look at Lot's life, 
What a wicked man. Man, what a wicked man. Anybody that would give their daughter to a bunch of homosexuals. That's what he said. Uh, uh, are you hearing me tonight? How wicked, how vile, how wicked he was. And I'll just say this tonight. If God can save somebody like that, I'm telling you, there's never been a person so wicked that God can't save tonight. Just today, I just got out of jail a while ago. I'm glad y'all come to hear me preach. <laughs> I did, I just got out of jail just a few minutes ago, just a little while ago. But while I was in there this afternoon, my brother and I, my blood brother and I, I used to go get him out of jail. Now we go to jail together and preach. Amen. Amen. And uh, we was in jail this afternoon in Surrey County. And I'm sitting there with my brother. My brother standing there talking to this black man, wicked, lost in a mess, vile. And boy, God put a holy hush over that cell. I'm telling you, the Holy Ghost sat down on that place. Anybody got any idea what happened to that guy? Huh? I tell you what happened. He got saved. Are you listening to me? And I see that every week somewhere. And I'll just say this to you now. They never, don't, don't give up on that loved one. You said, preacher, my loved one's wicked and vile. You don't understand. You don't understand who I'm preaching about. There's never been a person so wicked that God can't save. I looked this afternoon at my computer. I don't think I've ever told this illustration here. And if I have it, bears telling again. Several years ago, probably... I don't know, 1990, 89, 1990. I was, you fellas remember 1990, don't you? Yeah, okay. Any, <laughs> anyhow, 1990, 91. I was in revival in Stony Point, North Carolina. And I was going that night, uh, just a trio night, I was on a Wednesday afternoon, just a trio night. That's Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Uh, they, I was by myself that night. And I stopped at Moore's Department Store. Anybody remember that? Moore's Department Store in Moxford by me a hat. Back of my head gets wet when I preach and if I don't put a hat on shortly thereafter go out in that hour I get a sore throat. So I stopped to get me a new hat and uh, I, I sent in and I was trying on those hats and two aisles over from me was a white woman in a black bed and both of them worked in the store and man they was, they was going at it they was arguing at one another and I, I'm sitting here trying on these hats and man I hate doing that you just, every time I try one on, I could just feel the, you don't know who's headed on. I could feel them cooties. <laughs> you, you just don't know who's had that hat on. And, and I was trying them on. I don't like doing that. And, 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 and you say, what's a cootie? Ask the man with a beard. He can tell you about it. But listen to this. <laughs> I was trying those hats on. And those two aisles over, they was... They was almost getting ready to get in a fight. You know what they was arguing about? Eternal security. I thought, dear Lord. <laughs> they about to get in a fight. And the, black, the white woman's lost and the black boy's trying to lead her to Christ. And the uh, black boy comes over to me and he's getting ready to wait on me. And uh, he said, hey man, said, you're a reverend, aren't you? I said, man, no. I ain't no reverend. By the way, that's just in the Bible two times it has reference to God. But listen to this. Holy Ghost said, you better tell him the whole truth. I said, I'm a pastor. He said, wonderful. Said, this woman over here is going to hell. She's lost. Tell her about Jesus. I said, I ain't about to tell her nothing. I learned a long time ago, somebody arguing about religion or politics, you better go the other way. So I wasn't going to do it. I wasn't going to say nothing to her. If I last got the hat, I was going to buy and walked up to pay for my hat. That little lady that was arguing with him waited on me. She rung me up. And I paid her for the hat. She said, wait a minute. She said, sir, what do you think about eternal security? And I looked at her and I said, ma'am, the truth of the matter is eternal security is not the issue. She said, it's not. I said, no. She said, well, just what is the issue? I said, the issue is if you die right now, you're going to die and go to hell or go to heaven. Oh, and I said that. She started crying. She said, preacher, I'd go to hell. And I said, thank God on a hill far away. And I started telling her about Jesus. And about that time, somebody hit me on the shoulder. I turned around and looked, and it was the manager of the store. And the guy said, sir, you can't do that in here. I said, I already have. <laughs> and I grabbed the woman by the arm. I really did. Grabbed her by the arm. Took her outside in front of the courthouse, Marksville, North Carolina. Took my Bible and laid across the hood of my car. And told her the sweet story of Calvary. How that Jesus loved her. How that Christ died for her. And boy, she's standing there weeping and crying. And I'm preaching to her about Jesus. And I said, now listen, ma'am. He'll save you right now. 
All you got to do is ask him. All you got to do, you realize you're a sinner, you realize you go to hell, you realize the gospel, he'll save you and he'll do it now. Now while I pray, you're going to have to pray. My prayer won't save you. You asked him to save you. You asked him to come into your heart according to this verse right here, verse 13. I got done praying, I looked up at her. She looked at me, she wasn't smiling, she wasn't crying, she looked confused. I said, ma'am, did you not understand what I said? She said, sir, I understood every word you said. But she said, preacher, what the problem is? And she started crying. She said, preacher, God cutting and God don't love me. And I made the mistake by asking why. And come to find out she was an old ex-prostitute. I don't even think she knew who the daddy of some of her children were. Her, she lived a wicked, vile, wicked, wicked life. And uh, she's standing there crying and I'm standing there thinking, what am I going to say next? And I said, Mama, will you let me read you one more verse? She said, yes, sir. And I flipped over the book of Timothy and I read her this verse. This is a faithful saying Amen. and worthy of all acceptation. Christ Jesus come into the world to save sinners of whom I'm chief. Amen. I said, Mom, you're pretty bad, but you got here too late to be the worst. God, <laughs> hey, hey, hey. I said, God's already saved the worst. And if he saved him, Mama, he'll save you. She's standing there just crying. And I said, I'm going to pray again. And I said, while I pray, you pray. And you ask the Lord to come into your heart. When I got done praying that time, I looked up at her and she's crying and laughing at the same time. Anybody got any idea what happened? <laughs> Are y'all hearing me preach tonight? There's never been a person so wicked that God can't save. There's never been a problem so big that God can't solve. There's never been a prayer prayer that God can't answer. Man, what a text. Is there anything too hard for the Lord. We're living in a generation. I'm done. We're living, we're living in a generation that this world has thrown you a curve. I'm telling you, God is much God tonight as he's ever been. God is much powerful. I, I'm getting ready to finish my book on Elijah. Boy, I love, boy, I love, Eli I love the story of Elijah. And I uh, got 12 chapters in it. Getting ready to send it to the publisher. And, and I'll just say this to you now. Boy, you see the power of God in his life? Oh, my soul. He prayed 63 words and the fire of God falls from heaven. Oh, my. Y'all hear me preach tonight? It's the same God that he served that we're serving. He's not changed one bit. He's able, thank God. I could not go home and go to bed and go to sleep tonight if I didn't believe what I just preached. Yeah. I don't have to take a pill to go to sleep. I don't know how to take a pill to get going in the morning. If you do that, that's fine. I'm not throwing rocks at you. I'm just telling you tonight. <laughs> I lay down at night and say, good night, Lord. Then I wake up in the morning and I say, good morning, Lord. Hey, man, are you hearing me? There's nothing. There's nothing too hard for God. I don't know whenever I preach this message, but it was as clear as a nose on my face looking in the mirror today. God said, preach on, is there anything too hard for God tonight? Aren't you glad there's nothing too hard for God? Amen. Our Heavenly Father, as we stand to our feet tonight, I ask you, Lord, that you'll encourage your people tonight. Lord, you made it so clear in my prayer time this morning about this message tonight. And I pray tonight, dear Father, as we bow our heads, I pray you'll speak to hearts tonight. Lord, I pray tonight you'll encourage that child of God that's been waiting on the prayer to get answered, but it's not got answered yet. Help them realize now there's never been a prayer prayed that God can't answer. Help them realize now there's never been a problem so big that God can't take care of. And you do it exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think. You do it in such a way that we can't even explain how you do it. What a God. And I'm glad tonight there's never been a person so wicked that God can't save. Father, I pray tonight as our heads are bowed, I pray you'll speak to hearts. That child of God that needs to be encouraged tonight, I pray they'll come, maybe need to come and bring that load and lay it on the altar tonight and give it to you and let you take care of that problem. That one here tonight that's discouraging the prayer life, I pray you'll speak to them. That one here tonight possibly that's lost without Christ, I pray the Holy Spirit will finger around their heart. Do that that I can't do and we'll thank you. Our heads are bowed and nobody looking around while she's playing right softly. Can I ask you a question tonight? Listen to me. There's nothing 
Thank God there's nothing. Thank God there's nothing too hard for God. Nothing. I wonder not who I preach to tonight and maybe you just want to raise your hand and say, Preacher, man, I need God to help me tonight in some areas. I really need God to help me tonight. I'm saved, but I need God to help me. Would you pray for me tonight? Would you lift your hand? I'm raising mine before you raise yours. Hold them all over the building. I want to see them. I need help tonight. I see that. I wonder tonight, right before I finish my prayer, I wonder if there may be one here tonight say, Preacher, you know, I'm not saved or I'm not sure about it. I'm not really sure if I died tonight, I'd go to heaven. Would you pray for me tonight? I will if you raise your hand. I'll be glad to if you raise your hand. Anybody anywhere? Preacher, I'm not saved or I'm not sure. All right, can I ask you one more thing? You that raised your hands. And even if you never raised your hands, you want to meet us at the altar and pray about that situation tonight? Be a good time to do it. While these are at the altar praying, be a good time for you to come. Give it to Him tonight. You'll never get it worked out without Him. Are you listening to me? I witnessed to a man today, and he said, Preacher, I, I, I'm doing the best I can. I said, Sir, you'll never get saved doing that. you got to realize you're helpless. And our problems so many times, we're helpless. We've got to help God. Anybody else want to come? Father, in Jesus' name, I pray meet every need tonight. I'm glad I can preach with confidence in my heart. There's nothing too hard for God. Help these folk around the altar. Many raise their hands, work in their lives. Then, Lord, tonight, if there's somebody here not saved, don't let them leave in that condition. Help them come trust Christ. Meet every need tonight. Be with the pastor as he finishes up tonight and drives home. I pray in Jesus' name. While he sings tonight. He proved to be my victory.